بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Uh, welcome brother Abu Musab to another uh, interactive discussion. Alhamdulillah, the last time we were together, we were talking about physical fitness. Alhamdulillah. Um, I would have loved to have a part two before we have to do another topic, but alhamdulillah for, for everything. Uh, brothers and sisters, for those of you who are just tuning in to watch right now, I would ask you for one thing, uh, just to make sure that you can hear us properly, you can see us properly, so we can pass through all the administrative uh, issues, or you know, to make sure that the technical difficulties are, are eliminated. If you can please type in the comment section live, or salam alaikum, just so we make sure that you guys can hear us, you guys can see us. Insha'Allah. Uh, today we're going to have an interactive discussion, like, uh, like uh, as, as mentioned before, regarding a recent uh, video that uh, became quite viral online regarding uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi's comments regarding the penal code in Islam. In particular, the two specific uh, words that he used were problematic and bizarre. We're going to get into that. However, what we should mention here is that the, the issue is, is bigger than that. It's not just restricted to, um, you know, one thing, a slip of the tongue. He just accidentally jumbled something. He didn't mean to say something. The matter is, is, is bigger than that. Uh, if we look at uh, Dr. Yasser Khadi, the, the, the progress and the things he's been saying over the last, you know, many, many years, and uh, many of us have been, have been watching and, and seeing, um, the, the matter is not just about this, you know, if you think we're here to discuss today just what he said in that video in 2016, um, that's not what we're here to do today. We're, just, we're going to discuss that aspect, but there's more to it than that. And with me is Brother Abu Mus'ab. Um, we, like I said, we were together last time. Alhamdulillah, we, we had a lot of discussions about physical fitness. We had a great time in that. But our religion is very comprehensive. And Alhamdulillah, just, just uh, like we talk about uh, matters of faith, just like we talk about, you know, rituals in Islam, like anything else, you know, uh, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, is called Al-Furqan. You know, it, it distinguishes between truth and falsehood. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a book of refutation against falsehood. So one of the foundations in Islam that we have is that we enjoin what is good and we forbid or go against what is evil. And if anyone makes a mistake, in a public platform, somebody with a high, with a with a with a huge following, uh, it is our responsibility to clarify these mistakes, to advise the brother or the sister who made the mistake. But it's not really for that person per se. And I'm going to discuss why that's the case later on, inshallah. It's more about those who are following him and listening to him. So, brother Wajdi Akari, I'm going to let you begin, inshallah, with to set the the the, the platform. Uh, brothers and sisters, I am going to be watching the comments. If anybody has any questions, uh, good questions, you know, not, we're not here to, if you say, Assalamu Alaikum, I don't respond, don't get offended because we're trying to, you know, coordinate a lot of top, a lot of information, a lot of uh, things we're going to be discussing today. Um, but if you have a good question, inshallah, then please do post it. I'll be watching on my laptop down here. I have my setup, inshallah, I'm going to do my best to accommodate everybody. So without any further delay, brother, Wajdi Akari will begin to set this, the platform for today's discussion. Fadl Aqi. Zakallah khair. Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu wa sallam ala biyana Muhammad. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly to ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look, before we go a step further, there are so many disclaimers that have to be put out there because I know how hurt some of you are when we speak about a person that you cherish, a person that you appreciate, and specifically a person that you have learned from. I understand the challenge in that. I understand that you, have, you are forced in an effort to defend your brother in faith, in an effort to stand up for him, to uh, defend his honor, you feel that part of your obligation is automatically to also assume evil about anyone who speaks about him. My brothers and sisters in faith who are the most important target for me, when we speak about Yasser Qadi or others, the individual is actually not our objective. In fact, the individual is not important at all. In fact, the individual's name could be uh, YY uh, or AA, Anonymous Anonymous. 
if that anonymous anonymous is delivering uh, wrong information, misleading information to the Muslims, and you expect the rest of the people who have the same ideology in terms of wanting the other people to come to the deen of Allah. You have to understand that anyone involved in da'wah, they are part of one entity and one group. Consider us to be doctors in one uh, organization. Uh, uh, anything of, this, uh, similar, of similar nature. We have a mutual objective. So when we see that someone whether intentionally or unintentionally, delivering to you information that we know because you have not studied Islam at a certain level, you may be deceived by it. If we don't say something, then wallahi, we are deceiving you. And Allah will ask us on Yawm Al Qiyamah, we will be held accountable about knowledge that we kept to ourselves. And this is one of the most severe sins in Islam, which is holding back ilm that you know of. What you need to understand is that there's never been a personal issue with anyone we've ever mentioned by name. Because there's no personal relationship to begin with. I'm going to give you a parable so you can understand. And allow me, Brother Wasim, to just uh, discuss this a little uh, further. The parable of the people giving da'wah and the Muslims is like a court of law. In the court of law, there's a judge. And my brothers and sisters, the judge is the Quran and the Sunnah. The judge who will, who will decide about who's right and who's wrong is the Quran and the Sunnah. There's the defendant. The defendant is the person that we're trying to refute. In this case, we consider him to be the criminal, right? With just, just for, for giving examples purposes. We're not saying that he's a criminal in a... In a uh, a murder scene, he's a criminal from a religious point of view. He is the defendant, he's a criminal. The witnesses, the witnesses are the people of knowledge. Those who usually come and give their testimony that yes, I saw this or I saw that. And now the irony of this parable is that the Muslims are the victims and the lawyers. They're the victims because we, the witnesses, are trying to defend you in front of the judge, which is the Quran and the Sunnah, against the defendant who's the criminal. And you, who are being victimized by this person, instead of taking in this information for your own good, you actually become the very lawyer of the very person that is trying to change the deen that Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed. And if you want to turn a blind eye, wallahi you could. Anybody can pretend that they don't see. But what we're discussing about Yasser Qadi is not a solo incident. It is a trend that has begun a few years ago. And it is unraveling and developing and progressing slowly but surely. Where doubts that he personally has admitted he got when he went to Yale University. He is now sharing these doubts with the laymen who out of happy happiness with the eloquence out of happiness with the vastness of knowledge out of happiness with the celebrity status of that person they take in all this information with no filter to distinguish between the truth and the falsehood and in the context you are the one who who is jeopardizing your own relationship with Allah wallahi had this not been the case we would keep our mouths shut because we know that the Muslim has an honor that we have to fulfill and he has rights that we have to fulfill and there is transgression and oppression that we don't want to even come close to because we have plenty of our individual sins let alone to attack another Muslim let alone to attack a Muslim of knowledge had it not been serious to this degree and we only want you to see open your eyes and heart and right now as you listen ask Allah to guide you to the haqq wherever it may be don't be biased for us. People that are used to listening to us, don't get all excited. Yeah, yeah, take him down. And people that are upset with us speaking about him, don't automatically reject and say, I'm not trying to hear you. You hate my sheikh. You disrespect him. You attack him. Please take this with a grain of salt. Understand that we have noble objectives. Understand that we are obliged to do this. Just to make a clarification. Afterwards, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ Really, you don't guide those whom you love, Allah guides whom He wills. But in terms of establishing the hujjah, then it has to be done. 
and our humble effort is to do so. Uh, I just want to answer a couple of other issues. The first issue of uh, husn al -dhan. People say, why don't you have a good assumption about a person? I want to mention to you something that al baghawi mentioned in regards to the ayah about su al dhan because Allah says, ijtanibu kathiran min al avoid a lot of assumption. And Allah says, inna ba'da dhanni ithim, verily some type of assumption is evil. There are times where if someone has a trend, then you are allowed to assume bad about them. For example, Yaqub, the first time around when his, his sons, he, they took Yusuf and they put Yusuf in the well, he said to them, بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا Time went by and eventually when they went to Yusuf himself and he took his brother Binyamin, they, this time they were innocent. They went back to their father and said the same thing and he said the same exact words. And this is in Surah Yusuf, he said again, كَلَّا بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا Nay, but your souls have enticed you to something. The scholars say if someone has a, a trend, a pattern of constantly trying to cast doubt, then you can no longer assume good every single time. If, every, if someone's trying to take you towards doubting the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, someone making you doubt the, the validity and the applicability of Islam in this day and time, then this is a trend that he's been doing for some time. And I'm working on a proper refutation, inshallah. Well, I will show you in video his claims and his own refutations with a work with some brothers that we know to prove to you how this person is giving you conflicting information over the years and people that don't have knowledge are simply lost in between. So I, I have more to say, but I don't want to hug the mic. So uh, Brother Wasim, if you want to add a couple of points to this idea. No, Akhi, Barakallah Feek, to be honest, uh, this thing about Husn uh, al you know, having a good assumption of your brother, uh, something you pointed out, and it actually reminds me of a story. I mean, uh, those who may not relate, like we grew up, you know, watching some story, cartoons and stories. The famous one about that shepherd in the mountains, every time, you know, he called the people, oh, there's a wolf coming to eat my sheep. Every time he called them, and they came, and there was no wolf. First time, second time, third time. And then when a wolf finally came, he called them for help, and no one came. He says, he's a liar. And then the wolf ate his sheep. Yani, when, when someone is, uh, yani, this is the thing. Um, even the Salaf, the, the, the pious uh, uh, predecessors, we know. About that shepherd, that when they, when they, every time, you know, he called the people, oh, there's a wolf coming to you. When they refuted, when they refuted, and when they did what they did, you know, when somebody was called a person of innovation, it was because this person was calling to it, and he just he insisted on keeping up with it. He didn't. It wasn't like somebody who had a good foundation of the sunnah and he just slipped and made a mistake. Unfortunately, some of our, of our brothers today, may Allah forgive them, they promote a good aqidah, but their methodology is messed up. They go too far in refuting and, and, and anybody, if they make one small, what they perceive to be a mistake, this person's off the manhaj completely. We're not calling for that here. Uh, Dr. Yasir Qadi, with all the respect to him, you know, and, 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 and the stuff he studied and what he did and what he went and what he did, like this trend has been something that's been ongoing. And other people have spoken about him indirectly, but I think it's, it's time that someone speaks about him directly and addresses the exact problem. To me personally, I mean, there's a lot of things that happened before, but the thing that shocked me was that interview, you know, the podcast, you know, Yasir Qadi reveals all. And what does he say? Oh, study any aqidah that you want. Really? So somebody who believes in Allah, so ash'ari, maturidi, athari, it's all good, you know? Conflicting beliefs about your own creator, who he is, what his names are, what do they mean? What are his attributes? The very foundation, the most important element of belief who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or you can believe in Allah any way you want. I mean, where's the, where's the, where's the certainty? Where's the yaqeen? Where's, where's the, the firm belief that we have? He undermines the aqidah. And I'm going to mention this, and Brother Wajdi, I'm just going to mention this, and I'll go back to you. The doubts that he has about the building, you know, going to Yale and the whole building coming down and crumbling and it's all like Lego pieces. You have to rebuild that building you built in the University of Medina or Azhar or anywhere else. These doubts people have from my experience since I've been on Facebook and before that, if you don't have a foundation in Aqidah, the shaitan and the evil forces will take you away from the haq and in, in, in steps. If you don't have a firm belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't have a firm Aqidah, this is where the doubts come. And so it's no coincidence to me that Dr. Yasir Qadi, because he says, oh, these the Salafis or these Atharis, you know, the, everything is Aqidah, 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 and they beat it to death. Akhi, this is the foundation of the religion. If someone dies with all the sins 
that are that are as, not, a, not promoting someone sinning, but if someone dies with, with many sins, but he has tawheed, he has the aqidah properly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may from out of his mercy forgive that person for all of his sins just because of la ilaha illallah, that he believed in it and understood it and, and, and knew it, right? So if you undermine aqidah to me, to me, it is no wonder that this very same person is going to have doubts about, oh, uh, the hadith is this and the Quran might be that and we, ha- we can't look at it this way and we have to, we have to almost like look at the whole belief all over again. Like the Asha'ara say, the Asha'ara tell you there's something called nadar. You know, you have to look at your belief and you have to deconstruct everything. The same what he's saying, deconstruct the whole thing and then you have to somehow understand it with your mind and believe in it after having doubt. What does Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell us? Every one of us is born according to the fitrah, the natural disposition to believe in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, Not born with doubt. So the, so the, 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 the natural inclination and the, the natural disposition of, of, of every human being, the, no matter what the religion is right now, is that they know that there's one Allah, one God. And then their parents are the ones that change their way in, uh, into different religions and so on. So to me, this is, this is, where, the, this is where it started with me, is that, is that how can someone say that you can study any strand of aqidah that you want, as if there's no proper aqidah in Islam, it's all like fiqh, you know, like jurisprudence, there's a difference of opinion, you know. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says he created the, uh, Adam with his, with his own two hands in the dual form, it just means power. Some of them say, no, 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 it, 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 it's not, it doesn't mean what it says. Some of them say, no, it's literal. Where's the haq? Where's the truth? So this is why I, this is what I have to say, Akhi, and, and I'll let you inshallah continue. Barakallahu fi. Well, ironically, in the same in that same clip where he said that after you learn, you know, uh, the knowledge from Medina or from Azhar, from wherever in Pakistan, I forgot the school. He said then you go to Yale, you have to uh, reconst- deconstruct, and then it's like Lego pieces, you have to rebuild them. Then he said a very dangerous thing that I wish his his lovely followers will will pay attention to. He said, so when they're trying to historicize in the process of the non-Muslims who are teaching him Islam, in the process of historicizing everything, meaning trying to give you the historical background, he said to himself, the one thing that he will draw the line that he will not touch is the Quran. And that is the first indication of that segregation between the Quran and the Sunnah. As though we're saying that the Sunnah now has to be looked into further Whereas the Quran is going to be the only thing that is untouchable to me. Now, please pay attention to the pattern that you will hear afterwards. Because from that philosophy, which is the Quran is the only thing that I will not doubt. And I'm not even going to, he said, because if you allow them to historicize the Quran, if you start looking to the Quran, then you will have nothing left. Which is the most, uh, the, the wildest thing a Muslim can say. Actually, if you get the average Muslim from the street and you tell him that if, if I brought some, some uh, doctor from Yale, to teach you about the history of the Quran and the Sunnah and the, and, and the process of how this information was, was conveyed to us. Will that make you doubt the book of Allah or the Sunnah of Prophet for a second? He will probably smack you right in the street and tell you, man, go home, man. Are you kidding me? I'm going to the house of Allah to pray jama'ah. Are you, are you going to come here and make me doubt the deen of Allah? And that's the average Muslim whose iman could be yani, running on empty. So for someone to say, I'm not even going to allow the... Uh, them to historicize the Quran because if you go there even then you will have doubt that's the first flag the second flag is that means that the Sunnah does not have the same privilege now once he said that then you have a pattern that pattern of Ya'juj and Ma'juj what is the source of Ya'juj and Ma'juj the Sunnah the ayat of the Quran don't address the details so now we can explain them away the issue of hudud, is it in the Quran, that ayah, is it in the Quran? No, it's been abrogated from the Quran. Where does it come from? From the Sunnah. So, and what people don't know, yeah, brother Wasim, I actually, you know how people say, Ya Akhi, fear Allah, you only heard a clip. I want to hear the whole thing. Yeah, Captain, the whole thing is on YouTube. I watched it today from the beginning till the end. And wallahi, what he says before and after it is worse than that part. What he says before and after is worse than part. Number one, his audience is a combination of Muslims, Christians, and people of other faith. And the evidence is that woman who says at the end, uh, how many sisters are wearing hijab? Please raise your hand. And all these sisters, they didn't show them, but all these sisters supposedly raised their hands. She was addressing a crowd that had hijabi sisters, number one. Number two, he said at some point, he said at some point, the fact that stoning, stoning, used to take place in medieval time 
that is not indicative of Islam in any way today. Do you know what that means? And that statement is more dangerous than the one that has been circulated about them being bizarre and them being problematic. Forget about that. The fact that he said that the fact that stoning used to take place or that you see it every now and then, he said it does not represent Islam. It is not indicative of Islam in any way. And those matters we are visiting now and discussing. Me and the other scholars are trying to basically look into these rulings and see يعني, how can we remove them from the, the religion of Islam. Ya jama'a, you're looking and, talk, and you're listening to someone who sweet talks you with a story about uh, Durra bint Lahab bint Abi Lahab and she was a miskeen and then at the end of the post he takes a swipe at all of us and this is the most this is the filthiest way of attacking someone he says to anyone that speaks against him anyone that criticizes anyone that only sees the false they are consigned to the dustbin of history yani the, and then he says the el elite the people with with intelligence the people of high class such as himself are the ones whose legacy will remain do you understand how arrogant a human being has to be to say this? For someone to say that when I'm speaking, this is my legacy, and for all those people that are constantly trying to find mistakes in what I say, they are consigned to the dustbin of history. Wallahi, this is kaburat kalimatan takhruju min afwahim. This is a great word that goes out of his mouth. And the Prophet وسلم, in the hadith, no one is allowed to say Allah will not forgive such person. Allah will, you know, have, you don't know how the ending is going to come. No one knows the ending of things. So, ya akhi, stop pretending to be high class by belittling everybody who has any objection to what you say. Either we clap for you and beat the drums so you're satisfied. And if we say something against you, we become nobodies, neophytes. You call them all different names, all different titles, all belittlement of the other Muslim because you are on a platform that we didn't reach because you remind us in every opportunity that you have a PhD and that you are specialized in Aqeedah and that you got you from Yale University. I've never seen someone repeat his credentials in any given occasion across lectures in my life. No one repeats his credentials more than this. Ya akhi, ma'lish, humble yourself a little bit and don't take us as some enemies. Wallahi, we, don't, we care for you to a degree that we want Allah to guide you because we know that you could be an asset for this ummah. No one is going to take away from your knowledge and from your, the effort that you put. Jazakallahu khairan. Of course it's appreciated. But the deen of Allah is not that. Otherwise, you can go learn from the khawarij. If you really want to learn how to pray properly, how to fast properly, then the khawarij were better than the sahaba. The Prophet ﷺ described them that you will, you, will, you will belittle your salah compared to their salah. You will belittle your siyam compared to their siyam. They will have rough knees and hands from constant sujood. Then he called them the dogs of the hellfire and that the Quran will not go past their collarbone. So if you want to use a person's uh, uh, doings and his effort as a yardstick for his righteousness and that what he's communicating to you is sound, then how will you explain the analysis that the Prophet ﷺ gave to the Khawarij who were superior to the Sahaba and worship but were among the worst of this Ummah until today? Our religion does not work on these grounds. The fact that you learn so much does not mean that the fitna has not encompassed you. And how do you know if the fitna has encompassed you or not? We have standards. Look at any of the Mashayikh, Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh uh, Salih bin Uthami, Rahimahumullah, Sheikh Al Albani, and sh currently Sheikh Al Fawzan and Ruheli, and watch their legacy from the day they started until now. You will be amazed at the consistency. You will be hard pressed to find a fatwa that opposes another fatwa in a matter of, of a minor matter. Look at Yasser Qadi. He has refuted everything he taught in the past. The one who used to be jealous for the Islam and the Sunnis and be careful of the Shia and how could you love someone who curses your mother Aisha? How could you be friends with someone who says this about the Sahaba? And then a few years later, he's standing next to them. I made some mistakes in the past. I made some inflammatory statements. I take them back and now we're going to join hands with the Shia. When you see the contradiction over the years in everything from teaching the, the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah and the names and attributes of Allah to saying, well, you can select from the four madhahib, and while you add it, you can also select from the th three theological madhahib. The Ash'ari, Maturidi, and Athari. Are you kidding me, uh, Shaykh? Yeah, Shaykh, the people, wallah, the people are already lost, and they look up to you. So when you open this door, he's going to go read one of these aqaid. Then he will never know who Allah is. 
Then he will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and say, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, I did not know who you are because of this, because of this man. You will have to answer for this. Because the, the shuyukh that you quote, Wallahi, they don't agree with you. You are, you are hiding under the robe of the big mashayikh. Wallahi, they will, if they heard you today, they, they would probably not allow you to address a, a five-year-old child. Because you will cast doubt into his mind. So my brothers and sisters, as, as hard as it is for you to, to digest what we're saying, understand the gravity. The problem is that we are very passive as Muslims. We are very passive. We, we, we look into every matter and we in, yani go in depth. When it comes to the matter of the deen, we become so superficial. Someone writes a couple of kind words, says a couple of nice things, tells you about the seerah, and we, yay, we all just want to have a party and celebrate. There, there are bigger issues that you need to be aware of. When someone tells you that what the rulings in Islam are not applicable, in, in today, because he lives in America, and he says, I, as an American cleric, I don't think about this before you go to sleep. Nobody's telling you tomorrow we want you to stone an adulteress. Yani, ya Sheikh, don't belittle the minds of the people. No one is making a revolution to try to implement the Sharia ah law. We all know that. We all know that. It doesn't mean that you say this is a classic medieval view that today we are looking into and changing. You're saying basically when Allah revealed the ayah, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum, this day I have perfected my relig your religion for you, that the religion wasn't perfect, that Allah wasn't aware. You are going to call now progressive and we have understanding and today we see things differently. That's what every deviant that came before you also said, Ya Sheikh, Jaham ibn Safwan or others from among the, 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 the imams of the Ahlul Kalam, they all had the same idea that they're going to be the new Mujaddid. And then he crashed into the wall and he crashed the ummah behind him. Illa man rahim Allah. Tfaddal ya Wasim, tfaddal. Allah al-musta'an. Subhanakallah fiqh, there's a lot, uh, I mean, for me, um, I, I've, I've, for a long time, I've, I've, I've sometimes made posts on my Facebook page whenever he did something. Very, I, was, I was being as respectable as I can and I never called him names or, or, or talked to him in a negative way. May Allah guide him and us. I mean, and yesterday something happened, subhanAllah, and I posted it on my wall. You know, I, I, don't, I don't go on his wall to post anything because I just tag him out of respect and he can see and he can uh, choose for himself. But one brother had a question because subhanAllah yesterday, you know, uh, we need, when the, the, the two terms we're talking about here is, is, is bizarre and problematic about the Islamic penal code, right? And... and one brother addressed him under a different post of his, and he's talking about some economics issue or something. And, and, and the brother tagged me and yourself and brother Daniel, and he was asking for our opinion. I saw brother Yasser Qadi's uh, um, you know, explanation about what he said, and he's, he's starting to realize maybe, maybe I wasn't using the best choice of words, but then he did something very strange. He used um, some terminologies in, in, in the sciences of hadith, you know, mushkil al hadith. You know, well, yeah, and 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 he's as if as if to make it seem like no, no, no. I was using the terminology of the sciences of hadith that when they, when we say mushkil al hadith in Arabic, it means that we're trying to reconcile between what seems to be contradicting and, and things of that something within the sciences of Islam, and that that's what he meant. How how can you how can you use that term in English and expect that the non-Muslim audience is sitting in front of you, the Jews, the Christians, and whoever? Well, understand that, yeah, by problematic, he means it's something in the sciences of hadith that, uh, that Muslims are discussing amongst each other and they reconcile between the... They, they inherently don't believe in Islam to begin with. When you take the, 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 the scriptures of, of the people of the, of the scripture, the people of the book, the Christians and the Jews and the Quran in one breath and say all texts and then you say the word problematic, what is someone going to get the impression of that? Are they going to get the impression that, oh, he meant that problematic in the sense that it's a science and Islam... So he, he is taking a, 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 an Islamic term and he's twisting it, I'm sorry to say this, and he's changing it around to make it seem that what he said is fine. And I have yet to see an apology from him. And what I, when I responded to him and said to him, this is what you did, my comment gets deleted and I'm no longer able to comment on his wall and he leaves everything else, subhanAllah. Yeah, and you couldn't even respond to my, to, my, to my response to you in a respectable way. You know, subhanAllah, you, you use the terms bizarre. Now, bizarre, of course, you can, maybe a new post will come out and he'll say, oh, bizarre. I meant by bizarre, I meant shad, you know, because shad is also in the sciences of hadith. It means, 
So what, will, what will the layman think about shad? They'll think shad means something way out there. Well, shad in, in, in hadith sciences means, which I guess you could translate as bizarre, which is not a good translation anyway, is hadith which is already authentic, the narrator is authentic, but he contradicts a bunch of other narrators who say the hadith in a different way, perhaps. It's odd. The actual word is odd. If it's shad, meaning it's odd, meaning it's not in line with the other. The term bizarre can, can never be applied in this context. But Brother Wasim, you, that's what I'm saying. I, 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 inshallah, I will post. You see, here's the issue. I want to post the video, the full video for the people to watch. At the same time, I don't want to promote this person because the amount of poison that he, ya akhi, when he tells, when, when they ask him about the issue of the penal code, okay, and the, the issue of, of stoning the adultery, he says, he says, we, are, we get very hurt when you see the Muslims in this light. And then he says, this is similar to, imagine if, if you didn't know anything about America, and the only window you had to know about America was Jerry Springer. So he said, what kind of impression would you have of Jerry Springer? This is the impression that this is how we feel that you're being unjust when you look at the issue of stoning the adultery and you want to basically understand Islam in that light. That's why he said, this, these incidents, they happened in, back in the time, or you may see them every now and then, they are in no way indicative of Islam, and we are revisiting them, and we are discussing them, which is something that we must do. So look, man, he's actually lucky in that sense. He's fortunate that the person who only took that part of the video took out the part where he used the term bizarre and problematic. If it were up to me, I would actually take that excerpt, and that one you cannot explain. Because if he merely sent, if he merely meant mushkil, as in, in the science of hadith, or in the matters of fiqh, when there are contradictory views, then how will you explain to the people when you straight up tell them that that act of stoning is not indicative of Islam and that we are trying to visit it today to see how we can update it, how we can look into it again. This is a clear, a clear uh, expression of the, the fact that the law requires revisiting, that the law of Allah is open uh, to change, the law of Allah is not applicable in this day and time, and the biggest irony, and this is something that you will vouch for, is that he uses Abdul Aziz Al Fozan, who actually, in his article, he refutes him. He refutes him point per point. Abdul Aziz Al Fozan, whom he used as a crutch to tell you that I'm not the first one to bring this. I'm only, and I, I, what did he use the word? I used my right. Uh, conveniently translated or switched words and this is what a good translation does and all this he actually selected from the sheikh what what meets his objective and then he left out what the sheikh said of of people that claim that it is not applicable that is barbaric that these people are straight up borderline out of their mind for someone to even accuse the deen of allah that the people know better than allah ya akhi wallahi ya akhwan ya brothers sisters wallahi this is deceit Wallahi, billahi, wa tillahi, this is deceit. You are allowing a person to use his knowledge that you don't have, his access to the Arabic language that you don't have, to select the kind of message that he wants to communicate with you. And mind you, it is not him. It's a group of people that obviously seem to be meeting in some way. Um, they, there's an agenda that is addressed on a yearly basis. And allow me to mention other names. So you go to Omar Sulaiman. By the way, you see in the latest talk of one of the latest talk of Omar Sulaiman, Yasser Qadi presents him. And then Omar Sulaiman speaks. There's actually consistency in the type of message that they want to deliver to the Muslims because they are on that pedestal that the rest don't have. And if you look at the condition of the Ummah, do you see the people going back to Allah or leaving Islam? You see the people are leaving Islam. If what they were doing was successful, then the people would be returning back to the deen of Allah. Like what happened in the time of Shaykh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, when the Ummah was immersed in shirk, and there was a real reformer who brought people back to Tawheed, the whole Ummah changed. Tawheed spread um, um, across the Muslim world, and Allah brought a lot of barakah for the Muslims. If what these people are doing to, today is, is actually sound, then we would see some blessings from Allah. We will see the condition of the Ummah improving. This is a sign that what's being shared from the people that have the, the leverage, the people that have the platform, is not the pure Islam. And why do we have to complicate things? Yeah, Jama'a, all we're saying is the Quran and the Sunnah, as our righteous predecessors understood it. No sectarianism, no violence, no, no bigotry, 
All these things that the people try to attach to scare you away from the da'wah is actually another form of deceiving the Muslims. We are trying to call the people back to the deen of Allah. If Allah reveals something, we say, Sami'na wa ata'na, ghufranaka rabbana wa ilayka al-maseer. We hear and we obey. We hear and we obey. This is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who warned us. He said, you shiku, a day will come when one of you will be sitting on his couch and then someone will say to him, my hadith. And then he will say, baynana wa baynakum kitabullah. Between us and you is the book of Allah. Whatever we find in it, we will accept. And whatever we don't find in it, we will reject. The Prophet وسلم, pro prophesied that this day will come when the people will reject the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and put it at a level beneath the book of Allah. And they go hand in hand. They go together. They are both the source of revelation. Our, our, the Prophet وسلم, said to his ummah, and the hadith is in Bukhari, Muslim hadith of Abu Huraira, verily my example, my parable in yours, is like a man who kindled a fire. And when he kindled the fire, all types of insects and moth started to rush into the fire. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to hold you back. I'm trying to prevent you. I'm trying to prevent you, my ummah, from going into the fire. But, but you, 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 against my will, you, you jump into the fire. Against the will of the Prophet ﷺ, the people want to jump into the fire. And today we stand here to tell you something similar. And you call us jealous, like this is some game, like this is some celebrity, we're like some Hollywood speakers. What jealousy, what batik ya jama'ah, who cares? Who cares who he is and what he is? Who cares about jealousy? You think we're fetching for mistakes? Who cares about fetching for mistakes? You, do you never, you want to assume good about one person and assume bad about the other person. And you fall into the same thing that you are warning against. You want us to advise him in private, but you're always advising us in public. Ya jama'a, wallah, we are trying to warn you like the Prophet ﷺ warned Ummah. And like he said, the people will... Look, there's a reason why a lot of the people will go to the fire. My brothers and sisters who are keyboard warriors, who you love to comment and criticize and slander every day, every day without being qualified to do so. We will take the responsibility. You say you're doing the same thing, we will stand before Allah because we are involved in da'wah. We will take that responsibility because we know that we're not taking this as some form of entertainment and Allah is our witness. But for you, if this is not your field, wallahi, it's best for you to remain silent. Wallahi, it's better for you not to defend and not to uh, warn against because you might wind up oppressing us and other Muslims thinking that you are defending one brother who will eventually might come one day and tell you, Wallahi, this Islam that you're following, I have nothing to do with. Wallahi, this version of Islam you're following, I am declaring my innocence from. Just like he said that he went out of Salafiyyah. He is no longer, it's, it was not, it was, what did he say? It was not uh, uh, academically or intellectually stimulating. What kind of Muslim says that? Salafiyyah is not intellectually stimulating? So in order to stimulate, I want to go to another strand of Islam where I have access to play around. And who's the victim? You, my brothers and sisters in Islam. And instead of saying, Jazakumullahu khayran, thank you for clarifying, at least now we can, we can be observant, we can be careful. You come and say, you're jealous of him. Brother, fear Allah, how can you speak about our Shaykh, our Shaykh? Ya jama'ah, we don't have this in Islam. Wallahi, we don't have this in Islam. This, this concept of celebrity speakers that I, I made videos on, we don't have this in Islam. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. If you give people a position bigger than what they have, Wallahi, you're harming him. The more you support, the more he will think, oh, if the general masses are with me, then everybody else must be wrong. Give us a break, man. Of course, I mean, this is a... It becomes, a, it becomes an issue of personalities, like, you know, who's more eloquent and who can speak sure. and, you know, why don't you go uh, debate him directly online and all this funny stuff. We're, we're, it's not about it. It's not an ego context, uh, contest here, uh, brothers and sisters. We're just trying to, to send you a message right now. I mean, the issue, the issue that, that, that we, we the, the context in which he mentioned what he mentioned in that video, I mean, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in, 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 in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, you know, Amr al-Khattab told us that the, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stoned he, he, the married adulterer. He, he, this is ordained during his time. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq himself did it as well during his time. And Amr al-Khattab said, and I stone. And then it says, were it not that I hate adding in the, in the book of Allah, I would have written it in the copy of the Quran as a, basically as a footnote 
so that people don't say that one day they'll come and they'll say, oh, it's not in the book of Allah, so we're going to disbelieve in it. I'm not saying Mr. Khadr is disbelieving in it per se, but he's going in that direction because he wants to reinterpret and modernize and change things around. So this is a ruling which, which, was, which is still intact, but there was an abrogation of the actual verse. And there's different, this is another science we're not going to get into right now, but Nasq and Islam is there. It's in the Quran. We, we know that it's true. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he says that the Nasq is there in order to test your faith. That one of the biggest examples of Nasq or abrogation is that the Muslims used to pray towards Jerusalem in the beginning. Yeah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this was not in the Quran, by the way. It doesn't say in the Quran, okay, pray towards it. No, in the Quran it says, now turn your face towards Mecca. So there's an abrogation right there that took place. And some people, and listen to this, during that time when it happened, some Muslims, they apostated. They left Islam because of the change of the... So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you to say what's going on. Oh, why did this change? And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah belongs al-Mashriq wal-Maghrib. You know, the East and the West belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah guides whoever He wills, right? So what are we going to say about that? And, and as, far, as far as trying to appease the non-Muslims, this was the theme of what I was saying. If you try to appease the non-Muslims, they're never going to be pleased with you until you become like them. Until you become like them, they're not going to be pleased with you. So you keep watering it down, watering it down, watering it down until what? You know, I, I, I mentioned Amr al-Khattab right now, and I mentioned him in another post, when he was going to liberate or, or take over uh, what was called Ilya at the time, or Jerusalem. When he was going, he was on his camel, or, or the animal he was riding. He came down in a creek of, or a puddle of water and picked up his shoes on his shoulder and walked. Abu Abad ibn Jarrah, a, a companion, basically didn't like what he saw because he's like, how are they going to honor you? And, uh, you know, because, you know, they have a different expectation level about a leader of another uh, empire coming to take over. And Umar Khattab said to him, I wish it was somebody other than you, Abu Ubaidah. Otherwise, I would have made an example of you for the Umar of Muhammad. Because Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah is a great companion. Umar Khattab was not going to go and punish him the way he would punish some other person, right? So... And he said that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically honored us with Islam. If we seek it anywhere else, if we seek it anywhere else, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to humiliate us, right? So when you're in front of the non-Muslims and you're saying these terms which are ambiguous at best and, and borderlining disbelief, the statements themselves at worst, who are, you, who are you impressing? Who are you impressing? And you know, something else I'd like to add as well, subhanAllah, you know, saying that it's okay to use the term bizarre and the, and the term uh, problematic, uh, about, about this very this very thing about stoning. Well, listen, I got something for you right now. For those who are on their computer or on their, on their, on their, on their tablet or whatever, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah versus the, 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 the Surah Al-Ma'idah, the table spread, verses 41 to 43. I'm going to read you the part of the verse 41 where, where um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the, talks about the, the, the Jews. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, about them, Ya you are so lay hasun Kaladina Sarah for Kufri, Menadina Kalu Amena before him and Tomakulubum, Menadina Hadu, some Maun El Kedis, some Maun El Kamil Akhilim Etu. Here's the key part. You harry funnel Kalima, and Badima Wadere, Yakuluna in Utitum Hada to Hudu, who want them to Tahu Fahdaru. Umir the love of Tatu for the Tamakalam and La Shea, Ulaya Kaladina Lamir the love of Tahra Kulubaham, love for Dunya Kazim, will have a Kit Adam Adim. I'm going to translate the meaning of the verse 41, the part that, that concerns us, and I'm going to read to you the tafsir of this verse. They distort words beyond their proper usage. The Jews, they distort words. Okay? Read between the lines now. Saying, if you are given this, take it. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what this means in a bit. But if you're not given it, then beware. But, but he for whom Allah intends fitna, never will you possess power to do for him a thing against Allah. Those are the ones from whom Allah does not intend to purify their hearts. For them is the, in this world is disgrace, and for them in the hereafter is a great punishment. So, if you go into Tafsir ibn Kathir, and, and, and see what the context of this verse was. Because I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to put you into a situation right now. We have Yasir Qadi, may Allah guide him, in front of non-Muslims, Jews and Christians, saying to them basically, uh, and, I, and I have the transcript here, and I, and, I, and, I, and I type the transcript. And by the way, even the article that he used of, of Dr. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Aziz uh, Al-Fawzan, I translated the relevant parts to show you that he didn't translate properly. May Allah guide him. Yes, the Qadi said in the Tumna clip, uh, the texts say things that are somewhat problematic at times. You all religious people know what I'm talking about, about, right? The texts have some laws that are somewhat bizarre, and this is all texts. And then what does he say? 
need I quote you Leviticus and Deuteronomy and whatnot? I mean, you know, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. He's talking about the, the scriptures of the people of the book. Now, Muhammad وسلم, from this verse 41 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed way back when Muhammad وسلم, was in Medina. What is the context of this verse? What is the tafsir of this verse? Right? The tafsir of this verse is that basically what happened is that there were people that were Jews in Medina who came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why did they come to him? Because they had a Jew and a Jewess, a, a, a man and a woman who were Jewish, they committed adultery, meaning that they, 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 they had sexual intercourse and it was done even though they were married or previously married. Okay? So the, the Jews changed the law they had in their book from Allah in the matter of punishment for adultery from stoning to death to a hundred flogs and making the offenders ride a donkey facing the back of the donkey. So they sit on the donkey and their faces are darkened and so on. When this incident of adultery occurred for after the hijrah, and by the way, I'm reading from Tafsir ibn Kathir right now. They said to each other, let us go to Muhammad and seek his judgment. If he gives a ruling of flogging, then implement this decision and make it a proof for you with Allah. This way, one of Allah's prophets will have upheld this ruling among you. So they're looking for Muhammad Sallam, or amongst you, sorry, to approve what they've distorted in their books. But then what did they say? But if he decides that a punishment should be stoning to death, then do not accept this decision. Okay? What does the verse say? They say the Jews, uh, it says here, in utitum hadha fakhudu wa lam ta'tahu fahdaru. So if you're given this, meaning the, the ruling of the, of the flogging, then take it. Otherwise, leave it out. So what happened in this incident? Well, I'm going to take you to Sahih Muslim in the book, the, 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 the book of Legal Punishments. And I'm going to read the hadith to you right now, which explains this event. Let's compare what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did with those two that committed adultery. Okay, by going to their books with what Yasser Qadir said that, oh, all texts are bizarre and problematic. Abdullah ibn Umar reported that a Jew and a Jewess were brought to Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who had committed adultery. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to the Jews and said, what do you find in the Torah for one who commits adultery? He's asking them, what's, what's not, not that he doesn't know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have, would have told them. They said, we darken their faces and make them ride on the donkey with their faces turned to the opposite direction and their backs touching each other to humiliate them. And then they are taken around the city. So they're taking around and basically humiliated, riding the donkey this way. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, bring the Torah if you are truthful. They brought it and recited it until they came to the verse pertaining to stoning. What happened? The person who was reading placed his hand on the verse pertaining to stoning. He covered it with his hand and read only that which was be between his hands and what was subsequent to that. So he, he, he covered it. Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a Jew, who became Muslim, one of the scholars of the Jews, Abdullah ibn Salam, he's very well known, you can read about him in the books of Sirah, who was at the time with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, command him, the reciter, this person is reading, to lift his hand. He lifted his hand. He lifted it, and there was underneath that the verse pertaining to stoning. So Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa pronounced judgment about both of them, and they were both stoned to death. Abdullah ibn Umar, the narrator of the hadith, said, I was one of those who stoned them and I saw him, that is the Jew, covering the, 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 the female Jew, the Jewess, with his body. So, what happened there? Did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say to them, oh, the ruling is bizarre. Just like it's bizarre with us, it's bizarre. Your, no, look at your texts, hear what they say. You want judgment? I'll do it based on your texts. And then what happened? It was implemented. So how does this compare with what Yasir Qari did in front of his audience who had the people of the scripture there. Is this, yani how can you meet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi on the day of standing, having said something like this, completely going against what he said? If it was my position, I would say, look at your books. Look at what your scriptures say, what you're not even following, which have contradictions in them. That's what I would have told them. So it's not something new. Let, let, let's simplify this. I just, any, by the way, I'm reading some of the comments. Of course, they are, they are, I'm going to say one thing, then I'm going to reply to a couple of comments. The first comment is, imagine you're giving da'wah to Islam. Imagine if at any point while giving da'wah to someone, you say, look, our religion is a little bizarre. Do you think by any means a person is going to be like, hooray, man, how do I enter your religion? Can you ever describe anything in our religion to be bizarre? And Mr. Yasser Qadi, the American, 
you're not the only one who lives in the West, and you're not, not the only one who lived in America, and you're not the only one who speaks English. You're, you always play on this part. Like you say that the mediev medieval is, is in reference to a, a time, a particular time, and among different eras. Habibi, we all know. And we all know that there's something called negative connotation, which you also know. And we know that when Muslims speak about the Salaf of this Ummah, in no way on earth we're going to use a term that is also used to describe people that were barbaric. And so if you go to any dictionary, while they will have multiple definitions for that term medieval, it will also include a negative one that has to do with people being backwards, uncivilized, and barbaric. And no Muslim scholar uses this term to describe our older generations. That term is not acceptable tooth and nail. But of course, slowly but surely, you keep using it and keep using it until it becomes normal, until other Muslims start using it. And indirectly, you're actually creating an image in the minds of the Muslim that there's a huge disconnect and divorce between the back older generations and the current generations. And that is exactly how you detach us from our legacy and from our heritage. There's that disconnect. Who's creating that? Modern Muslims. As for the person who says, why don't you speak about what's going on in this place or that place of having parties and having, ya akhi, ya brother, whatever your name is, Habibi. Look me in the face. We follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Wallahi, had the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, not commanded us to keep quiet about the people in charge, Wallahi, we would say whatever the truth commands us to say. The religion of Islam does not allow you to speak out against rulers. And look at America. When we say Islam doesn't allow protests, Islam does not allow riots, you start freaking out and panicking, and you say this and that, look, look, they've looted the whole, there's no right and wrong. If, if, if the police force is not there, everything gets jacked. Rich people, white people, black people, poor people, everybody's looting. You see, Islam is a guide. Islam, the, the one country where you don't have all these fitan is here. And the people who don't realize, they want you to advise their favorite speaker in private, and they want you to advise against the, the rulers publicly. Where the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ teaches the exact opposite. It teaches you that if you want to advise the ruler, Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you has an advice for the ruler, then let him take him on the side and tell him, if he accepts it, accepts it. If he doesn't accept it, you have fulfilled the obligation towards you. You are not allowed in Islam to cause this kind of khuruj. This is what the khawarij. What, what was the khawarij? The first man, Dhul Khuwaisra, was the first one to say to Prophet ﷺ, I'dil, ya Muhammad, I'dil, kalam ta'dil. Oh, Muhammad, be just. Really, you weren't just. He actually didn't go against him with a weapon. But he spoke in a public gathering against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu and he called him the dog of the hellfire. Do you want me to please you? Do you want me to become the dog of the hellfire to please you? And do you think that if you were to make a public announcement of the sort, then the ruler of the country was sitting there on his, with his hand waiting for, for, for me or any other speaker to make a video, and he's going to say, oh, Jazakumullah khair, okay, let me make the changes right now. How foolish is that? How foolish for you to even make this request? They already know they have scholars that, uh, that advise them, and the scholars advise them according to the sunnah in private. So you are not allowed to tell me to go against the Quran and the Sunnah and Wallahi I will not and no Muslim should. This is not a matter of preference or a matter of fear. It's a matter of submission to Allah. In the same light, I wonder how is it that you want those to be publicized but you want your favorite speaker, celebrity speaker to be advised in private. Ya akhi, at least be consistent. At least be consistent. In our case, there's no consistency because the person is delivering false information to you. I have to publicly, I have to make that public. As for the ruler, I have specific instructions to, the Prophet ﷺ said, Even if he were to slash you on your back and take your money, give it to him. This is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The sad reality is Muslims don't know. He's busy watching Netflix. And he's busy watching uh, a batikha with mango, and he's busy doing uh, whatever. He has no knowledge of Islam. Then he wants to become the mufti of the, the, the whole dunya. Come on Facebook. You love, yani you know that you can type fast. Khalas, ya Sheikh. Ya Sheikh, please learn. Go read a book about the ruling of uh, the aqeel of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah in regards to the people in charge. When you learn these ayat and ahadith, 
then you will learn why we behave the way we behave. And we've given lectures about it. But do you watch our lectures? No. Why? Because we don't have 5 million followers. So we must be deviant. We go with the one with the 5 million followers who's misleading you. These are your choices. Our job is to convey the message to you. It's between you and Allah at the end of the day. Wallah al Yeah. Jazakallah khair. One thing I would recommend, uh, because sometimes the, the, the sound cracks, maybe the microphone on your, um, on your thaw, maybe it's getting in the way i'm not it's, sure it's Just because of the streaming maybe change. i've been do i do zoom every ah. week for my aqida class it's the streaming there's no way around it inshallah like i said i will upload the full video which you can also upload on your channel so that we can have consistency no just a bit people mentioning one person was actually asking a question because we're talking about not this is topic we're not talking today about the rulers and, and their rights and all that but it came up one brother is saying Imam ahmed was in prison for speaking against the, the ruler is that wrong Imam Ahmad, you're going to use Imam Ahmad as an example. Uh, Imam Ahmad um, did not speak against the ruler the way that you're making it out to be. Imam Ahmad was against the belief that the Quran is created. And he kept debating. And by the way, this statement of the Quran being created, and this is something we have to mention here, the statement in and of itself is a statement of kufr, just so you know. Imam Bukhari mentioned this, uh, that this statement is a statement of disbelief. To say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words, his speech, uh, the Quran, is makhluq, in, 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 in implies that this Quran was not something that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, that he created this thing, and that it's not part of his essence in the sense that it's his speech. So you're, making, you're almost saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also created, just like his speech is created. It's an act of kufr, disbelief. Okay? Yet, Imam Ahmad debated the scholars of the Mu'tazila who were around the rulers at the time. He was flogged, he was tortured, he was jailed, and he persevered, did not, did not excommunicate the rulers because he gave them an excuse that these scholars around them were confusing them until at the end, one of the rulers later on who watched the debate was convinced about Imam Ahmed's position, freed him and honored him. And Imam Ahmed, by the way, later on was asked questions about these things in Iraq and so on. The, the narrations are there. This is someone who went through a lot of torture against, because of the rulers. And what did he do? He told the people not to rebel and not to cause bloodshed. This is after he suffered through so what do we have today? Someone gets jailed. I'm not saying that it was right to jail Imam Ahmad. I'm not saying that everyone in jail today has been jailed right, rightfully. There's oppression. No one's denying this. No one's infallible, brothers and sisters. But there are channels and ways to advise and things to do. We don't do something and then cause a worse thing to happen. This is the point. And the uh, Shaykh Hussain, by the way, in his book. You know what's interesting? Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad, rahimahullah, huh? he said, Al-Imam Ahmad said, لو أعلم أن لي دعوة مستجابة لصرفتها للسلطان. If I knew for a fact that Allah had one da'wah that He will accept from me, I will I will save it for the ruler. In spite of him actually being uh, imprisoned, he he and he was told, why don't you go against him and why don't you you know because you have followers, you have following who will guide you. He actually was among the people that understood the Hadith was Sallam about not going against the ruler and he said if I have one dua then I will keep it for the ruler which is what the Imams do until today they constantly make dua for the people in charge that Allah rectifies their condition that Allah guides us and guide uh, guide them that Allah Azza wa Jal makes them a source of good for the ummah because if you were to do other than that then you will abs you will get nothing but but bloodshed you will get nothing but lack of security and then the Muslim world it's already bleeding and they are parts of the body that are not bleeding what pay attention to what I'm saying the Muslim Ummah is one body many parts of it are bleeding those people that have this kind of ideology it's almost as if they want the whole Ummah to bleed if they see one place where the bleeding is not happening they continue to cause the fitna until there's lack of stability and lack of security like the rest of the world yeah Jama'a learn how to appreciate the blessings that you have they learn how to appreciate the blessings that you have and stick to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is a not a matter of desires. It is not a matter of emotions. Look, if you want to go by emotions, wallah, you will go astray. I challenge you to watch any video of Israeli soldiers beating Palestinians. And I've seen them. After you watch the video, wallah, you feel like you want to crash the wall. You feel like you want to go in the street and lose your mind. But Islam is not a religion of emotionalism. Islam is not a religion of you acting on instinct because you feel this and that. Islam is a religion of discipline and organization. 
So in spite of us feeling a certain way, this does not justify a wrong behavior. Just like we feel very bad that a, 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 black, a black person, an African American was killed unjustly and unlawfully, still as Muslims, we, are to, we don't react in the way people are reacting today. We have a civilized fashion of dealing with matters. First, Islam doesn't even support racism, but if we are in these Western countries, you still have to contain yourself and don't let your emotions control you because look at the example. People with Mercedes are parking in the middle of the street, run into the store, steal a TV and run out. When you let your emotions control you, you no longer are a responsible person and you need to maintain your responsibility. Wallahu musta'an. Barakallah feek, akhi. And, and this is the thing, because we're not act on emotions, we should not be uh, blind followers of personalities in Islam either. You know, when we're talking about the, the yeah, yeah, Dr. Yasser Khadi or anybody else with the, with the misguidance that, that, they're, that they're spreading, you know, don't take it personally that, oh, this is the guy I've been listening to for the last five, six, seven, eight, ten years. And maybe I can listen to him and take some of the good and leave off the bad. Do you really know, can you really filter out everything he's saying? Like I said, to me, it all began with the Aqidah issue. Study any Aqidah you want, it's all good, it's all the same. And the Atharis are, they, they put too much emphasis on Aqidah and it's not. If your Aqidah is sound, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep you steadfast and you will not have a problem, you will not be misguided. But if your Aqidah is something, or, or, or the, the, the studying of Aqidah is, or, or, or your faith, specifically these, these kinds of delicate matters, is left on the back burner and you don't give it attention, then, then you look at Islam as just some other brand. I mean, every religion tells you that it's good to be good to your parents, to the neighbors, to be charitable. Every religion tells you that. But one thing that makes Islam different than all other religions is the foundation of Islam, which is Tawheed. And this is the thing that, unfortunately, many speakers are lacking. You don't find people like some of what Brother Wajdakar mentioned, some of those names or others, they don't talk about Taqidah. Why don't they talk about it? Because they lose followers. It's going to cause division. But at the end of the day, you, you have to differentiate between haqq and batil. And, and Yasir Qadi, again, he just brings out his doubts. He's bringing out, yeah, yeah, Yasir Qadi, if you have doubts, keep them to yourself. Ask Allah to guide you and ask Allah to show you the way and to give you steadfastness. Okay, Muhammad Sallallahu in his own house would say, Ya Muqallib al Qulub Thabbiq Qalbi ala deenik. Oh, turn your hearts, fix my heart on your path. And this is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who are we? Ali right? so, so if your foundation is not there, and you don't know the basics of your religion, the foundation is the most important part, which is the, which is the salvation of you when you pass away. When you die upon Tawheed, this is your salvation. I mean, what's more important than that? SubhanAllah. So in the context of, of, of trying to appease the non-Muslims, the Jews and the Christians, I just gave an example of the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi how we dealt with the Jews in Medina. Compare and contrast that with, with what uh, Brother Yasser Khalid did in front of the non-Muslim audiences. You know? and, and like I said, uh, Brother Wajda Akari said that that clip is available. I haven't watched the whole thing and I'm going to watch it to see again the context. But again, he's saying that what came before and after that two or three minute snippet was worse than what was in it. Definitely. So, Definitely what was said before and after was much worse and all of them are, are aiming at one objective, which is that those rulings have to be visited. We're currently uh, as intra-Muslims having discussions about these matters. They're being re-evaluated. All such terminology was used, if my memory serves me well. We're going to visit them, we're going to study them, we're discussing them. Habibi, there's nothing for discussion, may Allah bless you. Wallahi, there's nothing to discuss. Allah Azza wa Jal gave us a perfect religion. We try our best to implement. If we're living in a Western country, then we become, uh, we, we can understand that there's uh, flexibility within Islam. We're not talking, uh, we're not turn, telling anybody to become militant. We're not supporting any type of violence. Wallahi, we're the first people to go to speak against violence. We're not trying to incite anyone in any sh wrong way. At the same time, we want our religion to be maintained and delivered as it was revealed. That's all, all we're asking. And you, you wanna hear something funny? When he spoke about the ruling of stoning the person, and then he was asked about honor killing. In the same video, Akhi Wasim, he said, ah, as for honor killing, I can tell you, well, well, I'm not lying, with no sugar coating, that the Islam, no, no Imam in Islam allows honor killing. So when, when asked about the stoning, he gave this dubious answer. When asked about honor killing, which we know is not allowed in Islam, he said, this time, I'm going to tell you honestly, and I'm not sugarcoating. What does that mean? That earlier I was not being honest, and I was sugarcoating. 
And the same thing about the uh, female uh, genitalia mutation. He said this, this act has nothing to do with Islam. This act is done regionally. People in certain countries, whether they're Muslims or Christians or, or even pagans, he said all of them as a cultural behavior, they have this, uh, uh, this behavior. As for Islam, it, I tell you honestly, it has nothing to do with it. And we both know that there are a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, authentic a hadith about this ruling in Islam, about the circumcision, whether male or female. Yeah, jama'a, and that's the part that you're missing. The people that know some Islam, even at our level, we know enough to see, to read between the lines. And our jaws drop and we scratch our heads. How can someone say these things so carelessly, so casually? You listen to the speech, as Prophet Sallam said, you are amazed with the magic of eloquence. Inna min al bayani la sihr. Some some type of speech is magical. So you're mesmerized, you feel proud. Alhamdulillah, he's a Muslim. He, he's dressed nicely, um, he's well-spoken, he's a good example of, of a Western Muslim. This is, this is how the shaitan deceives you. You get impressed with all the other elements which we appreciate like you. We, we actually like those things just like you like them, wallah. And we wish they were in our favor. We wish they were being used to channel the right in communication to the people. But unfortunately, you're paying attention to the surface and you're missing the, the bottom. And the bottom is, uh, is great, and the bottom is scary. And the bottom, once, once it starts coming out, then it will only get worse. You see, it started slowly but surely. Every, every few days, there's this kind of apologetic approach to things. There's this kind of, you know, given this, and yes, it's debatable, you may not understand it. Only people with knowledge can see it. The rest of you don't pay much attention to it. There's an element of brainwashing. You, you may believe us you may not believe us, it does not matter. It does not matter because we cannot enforce our opinions on anyone. I will say one thing, however. Between us and you is time. There are two scenarios. Either Allah guides him, Wallahi, I'll be the first one to celebrate. And I'll be the first one to put his lectures and link them and share them and tell all the people to listen to Yasir Qadi. I will be the first one, and Allah is my witness. If he repents and goes back to the same thing, he was, I'm not telling him to change. Just go back to what you used to be upon when you first graduated from Medina. If he does so, it is a promise from me that I will recommend him to every Tom, Dick and Harry. If he does not, mark my words, inshallah. Not because I'm a fortune teller, but because this is a trend that happened from the time of the Sahaba until now. It is only a matter of time before you yourself will say, Subhanallah, I was deceived. Subhanallah, I got deceived by this man. I wish I had taken the advice earlier. Trust me, this thing doesn't just end there. This thing will continue to unravel. It's a snowball. And it's going to continue to com complicate itself and get more sophisticated and more confusing until at some point you don't know what strand of Islam and what you follow. If not from an Aqeedah point of view, whether you're a modernized Western Islam to fit the American culture, everything is going to be lost slowly but surely until, and it's a sign of what the Prophet ﷺ said, that the, the Qiyamah will not come until لا يقال في الأرض الله الله until the people don't even know Salah. You have to understand the, the progression. Now, recently, the video of women leading salah in the masjid, and she's accepting everybody from other religion back. Women giving a khutbah, women leading salah, brothers and sisters are behind her, are praying together, something that we've worn against. All of this is the modernized, westernized, westernized version of Islam. And it will continue to get like this until people don't even know their salah. So we are the callers of those who want to delay this by the will of Allah as much as possible because if we let it just happen so quickly then our children will be the victims let us at least be reasonable and stick to our deen with love with passion with understanding and I, my final advice because I know we've taken too long my brothers and sisters please don't speak ill about people that are trying to protect you nobody makes money from this actually we're taking all types of risks by doing this wallahi Yani you must be really unfair to think that we get joy out of this or that this is something that is entertaining. Wallahi, our hearts crumble 
crumble from, from pain when we see that someone who is supposed to guide the Muslims confuses them. Wallahi, we get so upset and so sad. You think that we have some other alternative objectives and intentions? Yeah, I'm fear Allah. Fear Allah. Don't say evil things. If you're not convinced with our speech, no problem. I respect that. You think whatever you want to think, but don't verbalize it because otherwise you will have us as your contenders before Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That you accused us of jealousy when Allah knows that we're not jealous. You accused us of trying to get more followers when Allah knows that we're not looking for followers. You know what would happen if I wanted to get followers? I can preach the, the coolest kind of Islam. I will preach a strand of Islam that is nothing but love and nothing but cute stories and nothing but parables. We can all do this. But then, you, and you will have 5 million followers in no time. But our followers are in hundreds, thousands because we teach Aqeedah, we teach Tawheed, we tell them what halal is halal and what haram is haram. But when the Ummah is lost, who are they going to choose? They're going to choose the Imam who tell them, Yeah, Sheikh, it's okay, it's all good, inshallah, you're doing a great job, no problem. They're not going to choose the person who's going to remind them of Allah. They're going to choose the person that's going to justify their negligence of Allah. And this is why there's a big number of following there and not the same over here because the, the, the in Ummah's objectives have shifted from where they're supposed to be. So it's a natural byproduct. If you think that we are at war trying to shift the numbers to us just for the mere purpose of having more followers, we don't even make a single halala from this. Not even a cent, not even a dime, not even a dollar. We actually do this for the sake of Allah. If you believe us, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. If you don't believe us, may Allah forgive us and forgive you. We forgive you also, no problem. Yalla khair. No khair, barakallah feek. Uh, this is also very important. I mean, when you, when you become at that, when you get to that level of, of being a celebrity speaker or whatever, and you're getting paid to go and, and speak. I mean, like Brother Wardi said, I mean, uh, we're just simple brothers just trying to, just trying to con convey a message to you. Like I said, we're not making money from this. We're taking time out of our own personal time. We could be reading the Quran, we could be uh, studying, we could be doing whatever. You know, I'm in the process of, 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 inshallah, releasing a book at some point. I, I have a lot of stuff I got to do. You know, I have a family, and Brother Wardi has a family. We're just expressing our, our concern for the brother himself, Yasser Qadi, who's again on a, on a path which we don't envy, we don't envy him. Well, I would not want to be in the path he's, he's following. And may Allah protect all of you from following that path of doubt that he has. You know, um, if in the context of that clip, and I'm just going to end off with a few comments here. You know, if you say, okay, the, this, this uh, penal code is it's not really a relevant question to ask about because we're, we're not living in an Islamic country with Islamic legislation. Yeah, I could say that. You could say to them, you know, you might find that strange. You might find that bizarre. But reality is it has one, two, three, four, five. And if Yasser Qadi was honest and used Dr. Abdul Aziz Al-Fawzan's article properly, he would have used his points to refute some of the claims that some of them had. And maybe he could have shared the story that I shared about the Jews who committed adultery and how, you know, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used their own books to show that this is, this is the ruling of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. When you say that the rulings of Islam are bizarre and problematic, do you know who do you know do you know who exactly who you're appeasing? You're appeasing the liberalists and the modernists, the enemies are within the Muslim community who are trying to water down Islam and destroy it from, from the inside. This is exactly what you're doing. You're not doing any, anybody a favor. You're not you're not any, any how can how can a Muslim's iman become stronger when he thinks, oh yeah, the rulings in Islam are bizarre and problematic? What kind of, what, what, where's, where's the certainty in, 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 in belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is basically what I have to say. I really have nothing else to add. Akhir uh, do you have anything else you'd like to conclude with and, and final advice for, for the brothers and sisters who might be a little emotional, getting heated up? Yeah, yeah, that inshallah, in spite of you thinking that, you know, enough is enough and leave those people alone, inshallah, I will share with you not, inshallah, not too long from now, more evidences that you can see with your own eyes to, to understand what version of Islam that is being communicated to you by, uh, by this individual. So you will understand that this is not coming from a solo incident, it's not coming from hatred, it's not coming from bigotry or desires, it's coming from evidences that are clear like the sun. And our job is simply to communicate them to you, wallahi, because we intend nothing but good for you. At the end of the day, with all due respect, whether me or Brother Wasim or Brother Abu Ibrahim who spoke about it, anyone else who speaks, we can just go pray and go to sleep. Every day we can go pray, go to sleep, go to work. Life goes on. 
and life goes on. It's not going to bother us. It's not going to affect us. What Yasser Qadi says, what he says in America doesn't affect us. But because we care about our fellow Muslims, because that's what a Muslim does, because of that care, we take that effort. And it's almost like someone is coming to, to bring you, you know, drink, and then you grab the tray and you, you, know, you, you smack it in his face and say, get out of here. Yani, you, you, you treat the one who's trying to save you as the criminal, just like the example I gave you in the beginning, the parable of the court. You, you are the victims, and, you are, and we are the witnesses, and you are the lawyer that you're defending the, the criminal against the victims. Wallahi, يعني, it's, a, it's a sad state, but insha'Allah ta'ala, I know from the comments and I know from the sincerity of the Muslims, a lot of them, bi'idhnillah azza wa jal, many of them understand exactly what we're saying, many of them appreciate this, and many, many of them see this. And I know that no matter what you do, you cannot, you cannot please everybody, you cannot save everybody. On the, on the day of judgment, al-Nabi ya'ti, uh, the Prophet will come, وَمَعَهُ رَجُلْ وَاحِدٍ He will come with a man, another Prophet will come with no followers. A Prophet of Allah who's given da'wah, he will come with no followers. We're not looking, uh, we're not interested in whether people follow or not follow. We're interested that those who want to be awakened can be awakened and those who would like to stay asleep, then uh, you know, you can stay asleep but we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to awaken you to the truth sooner uh, or later. Jazakum Allah khair and I'm, I'm done. Barakallah fiqh brother Wasim. I appreciate what, what, the time and okay, the what, effort. What, what, and may Allah accept from us and forgive our sins. Whatever we said that was correct was from Allah. And whatever right. mistakes we made was from us and the shaitan. And Allah and his messenger are free from them. Uh, subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching this video. Subscribe and click on the notification bell. Like, comment, and share with friends and family.